the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the whole Israelite community and tell them, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. What does it mean to be holy? So it continues from Leviticus. You shall not bear hatred for your brother or sister and your heart. Take no revenge and cherish no grudge against any of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is hard. It's hard to love our neighbor as ourself, especially when there's affliction done upon us or upon someone that we love. And this is not the only the Old Testament message from Leviticus. It's what Jesus says as well as we hear today in our gospel. This gospel is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, the blessed are they. And now, of course, the last couple of weeks we've heard, what are we called to? We're called to be like Christ and follow in his ways and to know that we're not doing it by ourselves, but that he is with us. And today we continue this part of the Sermon on the Mount where it says, you have heard. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. Someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. Very challenging words. We continue. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. Of course, this last part. So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Once again, this may seem impossible. And it is impossible if we try to do it by ourself. But God is present. God wants to be part of our life in good times and in challenging times and hard times. Some of the hardest times where injustices are done against us or someone we love, we need to turn to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to love as you love. Help me to be kind and merciful. We hear about this from this beautiful psalm today, Psalm 103, the Lord is kind and merciful, which means that we too are called to be kind and merciful. I love verse 10 of the psalm and verse 12. Not according to our sins does he deal with us. I just want to stop right there. Not according to our sins does he deal with us. Praise God. Right? God's not out. I'm going to give you justice. You did this to me, so I'm going to do this to you. Mm -mm. Nor does he requite us according to our crimes. In verse 12 of Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he put our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west. He takes our transgressions and he takes them away from us. Cast them aside. Of course, we hear about this in the Our Father as well. Forgive us our, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We see this with Jesus himself on the cross as he is being crucified for us, unjustly accused. And what does he do on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. But as much as I say it, when it comes down to it, to be loving, to be forgiving, to be merciful, is hard. And so we must go to God and say, God, help me. Because I don't want to walk with this grudge anymore. I don't want to walk trying to get revenge on people or holding something against someone. I don't want to go to my deathbed not loving my brother or my sister. 
even though all the injustices they may have done to you? Is it worth carrying that poison that corrupts our soul and corrupts us from having that freedom that God wants to give us, that love that he wants to give us, that joy and that peace that he desires to give us? We know it's never worth carrying hatred. We're called to hand it over to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to love as you love. I want to use a story as an example today. It comes from a book. I've mentioned this book before. I've given out this book many times in the confessional as well. I buy them by the caseload. It's called Everybody Needs to Forgive Somebody. It's by Alan Hunt. It's 11 stories of, of real forgiveness, of profound stories of forgiveness. And one of the stories focuses on the country of South Africa. As we know, the world has always been filled with atrocities. We go all the way back to Adam and Eve. We have evil in the world. We have Cain and Abel. And we can see over and over and over again that there's a spirit of, dominion, a spirit of domination, trying to dominate maybe someone that's not like us, or that we try to take advantage, or whatever it may be. This in particular was happening in South Africa. One clan would raise to power, one tribe, and all of a sudden, all the other tribes would be suppressed or imprisoned, or God forbid. And it happened. Killed. Of course, we can think of the example of Nelson Mandela, imprisoned for 27 years. Eventually, he was released in 1991. In 1994, he was elected as the first president of South Africa. And even then, something profound happened. On his inauguration as president, he had one of his jailers present on the platform, trying to single, we need to have healing, we need to have reconciliation. And so the first act as president that Nelson Mandela did was he started something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to try to bring the racially fractured nation together of South Africa. Mandela wanted to diffuse the natural human pattern of revenge that he had seen firsthand in person, in prison, and in so many countries where one race or tribe had taken control from another. So this is how the Truth and Reconciliation Committee worked. The TRC would have hearings. And the TRC rules were simple, but profound. If a white policeman or army officer voluntarily faced his accusers, confessed his crime, and fully acknowledged his guilt, he could not be tried and punished for that crime. South African hardliners and many people grumbled about the obvious injustice of letting these criminals go free. Mandela, however, insisted that the country needed healing more than it needed justice. Healing over justice. He chose to focus on the radical agenda of healing, a new door that could be opened only with the key of what? The key of forgiveness and of love. Everybody needs to forgive somebody, and the truth is never more apparent than in South Africa. Before I continue the story, I want to let you know uh, there's some graphic details in the book. I'm not going to go into the graphic details. It's not age appropriate. But there's atrocities that, that happened. And in one particular case, there was an officer, his name was Officer Vanderbrook, and he had to share the crimes that he committed, and his accusers were present. Officer Vanderbrook was in the, in the police officer for a very long time, and over the years, he seemed to always kind of target different villages, and different neighborhoods, you could say. One day, he went into a neighborhood and took an 18-year-old boy away from his mother and father. He took him away, he killed him, and he disposed of the body in a way that there'd be no evidence. The mom and the father were obviously devastated, but at that time, there was nothing they could do. They had no power. Nine years later, Officer Vanderbrook came back. 
and he took the father and did the same exact thing. But this time, they don't even know where the body went. So Officer Vanderbrook had to admit to all these crimes. And of course, the mother, the wife, was there. And so the judge asked her, what do you want from Mr. Vanderbrook? You can imagine all the pain that she had, all the hurt that she had. So the woman stood up, and the crowd was hushed. She said first, she wanted Vanderbrook to go to the place where they had placed her husband's ashes and gather up the dust so that they could give him a decent burial. After all, that dust was all that she had left of her family. His head down, the policeman nodded in agreement. And then she said this. Mr. Vanderbrook took all my family away from me. And I still have a lot of love to give. So twice a month, I would like for him to come to the ghetto where I live and spend a day with me so that I can be a mother to him. And I'd like Mr. Vanderbrook to know that he is forgiven by God and that I forgive him too. I'd like to embrace him so he can know my forgiveness is real. Spontaneously, the courtroom started to sing Amazing Grace as the elderly woman made her way to the witness stand to give Officer Vanderbrook a hug, a hug of love and forgiveness, a mother's embrace. Officer Vanderbrook did not hear the words of the hymn. He had fainted, completely overwhelmed by the love and forgiveness that this mother wanted to give him. Everybody needs to forgive somebody. In this case, an entire nation needed to forgive a racially violent past. And one woman needed to forgive a man who had taken one of the most beautiful parts of her life. Very simply, she had chose to overcome Vanderbrook's evil act with her own act of love. Rather than holding on to the poison of those murders, the woman chose to release it. Rather than deflecting the poison of hate back into the face of Vanderbrook, she reflected it, the love, into his heart. Because of her, everyone in that room, including the man who had crushed her family, was changed by grace. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. I say to you, love your neighbor as yourself. It is so hard, but it's worth it to not have that poison inside of us, but to be like God who forgives us our transgressions freely and takes our sins as far as the east is from the west. And so we ask him, Lord God, help us today to love as you love Help us to be merciful as you are merciful. Help us to walk in this freedom of your grace and to be holy as you are holy.